Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Amongst the news items we have for you this week, a new way to prevent organ rejection for those who are donating and those who are receiving. A artificial kidney that, well, could mitigate some of the need for those organ transplants. Cancer in those under 50 has increased by about 80% over the last 30 years. China claims to have found a novel way of editing genes that does not rely on CRISPR. Environmental activists end up dying at a rate of one every two days, or at least so claims a report. A robot, after it finishes its job, self-destructs. Lauren Bobbitt exhibits behavior that demonstrates why it is that those who are ignorant tend to find themselves in an uncomfortable place. Plans for a uh, giant space telescope on the moon have been announced, and uh, the science behind gift giving. You can find the timestamps for these and other news items in the description box below. Let's start with technology to help with the issue of organ rejection. The simple reality is that if you are a donated organ recipient, you are going to be on a lifelong immunosuppressants. That's unfortunately because just about all organs are going to stimulate the immune system, at least somehow. This means that no matter what happens, you need to stop that from occurring, and therefore the rejection of the organ, and completely undoing the whole point of not only donating an organ, but having received said donated organ. The challenge with well, immunosuppressants as a general rule is that they suppress the immune system. This does leave individuals who are on them in a a somewhat more delicate position than just about everybody else. Their immune system is artificially suppressed and therefore they are more vulnerable to diseases and other issues that will crop up inevitably in life and as a result they are going to have trouble. This is why an alternative to, well, Immunosuppressants has been the holy grail of organ transplant technology for more than 20 years. The technology relies on an antibody, and it's called AT-1501. It is a monoclonal antibody, basically meaning that it's an antibody that's just been replicated many times over from a single precursor. The exact, uh, let's say, mechanism of action isn't at all explained by the manufacturer, and, well, to be quite honest with you, for good reason. They don't want others competing with them. What we do know is that it binds to the CD40 ligand. This is a well signal to T cells telling them to deal with this particular thing. So by blocking that, they're able to, for lack of a better way of phrasing this, uh, prevent communication. And by preventing communication, the T cells can't attack the donated organ that's been transplanted. In further organ and Developmental news, we have kidneys grown with human cells in pig embryos. Now, this is a somewhat important development, largely because it does open the pathway for, well, growing organs in animals that could be transplanted to humans without any need at all for immunosuppressants, or at least significantly less so. Now, take the uh, claim of success with a a lot of salt, as there are a number of issues with the research. Part of it, as harsh as it may sound, is that it's Chinese scientists, and they have previously made rather bold claims that turned out to be uh, less well substantiated or not necessarily as presented. Uh, For example, the uh, purported success of the HIV GMO babies. There's also other issues with this that raise questions and ethical issues, such as human cells were found in the pig brains and not just the kidneys. This means we don't know if this is about to become a huge ethical minefield or if we're about to get man, bear, pig. The ethical issues with this extend well beyond just the issue of, well, finding human cells in places other than the organs intended. Rather, it is effectively using the pigs as a a quasi-incubator. That is, the pig is solely used to grow these organs and then, presumably culled, the organs harvested, and, well, who knows what will happen with the remainder of the pig, but given that this is intended to be a a biomedical 
let's say, product, likely it's going to be treated as biological waste material and a hazard, thereby incinerated. The reality is that, well, the pig would have to be culled, as the way they've modified them is that they have specifically deleted genes required for the pig embryo to grow its own kidneys. This means that it must be human kidneys that are going to grow, otherwise it would never develop. And that's the issue. There is no way for the pig to survive post-harvesting, let's say. The creepy pig-human hybrids and other issues around this aside, it may not be as necessary if instead we want to go down the pathway of human-artificial product hybrids. That is something along the lines of a cyborg by using artificial kidneys. The reality at the moment is that, well, for most individuals, you're going to need hours, possibly longer, on dialysis just to live if you are on the donor transplant wait list. Now, yes, uh, humans could just donate more kidneys and this would solve the issue, or, as mentioned, we could have them grown in animals and transplant them that way. The other option, which is significantly more time efficient and likely to occur sooner, is this artificial kidney that could mitigate much of the need, at least for now, with kidney transplants. Now, these are, in a manner of speaking, somewhat more controversial, but also less. That's because they're more like a little reactor within the body. Within them, you'll find that there are kidney cells, and that these kidney cells recreate what would uh, otherwise happen in the human body under normal conditions. Unlike, uh, well, both the uh, pig-grown kidney and the uh, donated kidneys, this had one, uh, let's say, major advantage that really can't be counted at present. That is, it did not stimulate the immune system, and therefore there was no chance of reaction. This is the important caveat to it, although another important caveat is that all the research they did was conducted in pigs, so it may not translate to humans in, well, any way, shape, or form. In further bioreactor news, we have an actual reactor of sorts with E. coli genetically modified to generate electricity. Now, it's true that just about all living membranes will generate some degree of power. Admittedly, how much power will be generally far less than is of any kind of use, but theoretically it is there. This is why you often get a sort of natural gas generators occurring by using, well, decomposing organic matter under a house, releasing gas into a storage container, and that this is then passed on to a generator which burns it and more locally uses waste products. But this is a relatively new thing, and even that's not really all that efficient, given that you are burning a quasi-fossil fuel. Reactors using, uh, well, microbes in this case have been even less efficient and have been since at least 1911. The Swiss researchers took genes from a different species of bacterium called Schwannina onidesis and put them in E. coli. These genes are important as they allow the microbe to reduce metals and thereby produce free electrons. This is particularly useful as well that allows them to then do what needs to be done but they need somewhat unique environments. E. coli, by comparison, is far more robust and can, well, do just about anything anywhere and under any circumstances, which is often why you end up praying to the porcelain throne after having eaten that somewhat questionable meal out of the fridge or street-side food vendor. One of the applications for this is to use what is effectively, well, Budweiser, but more accurately, the brewery waste water that's used to clean out tanks and what remains after fermentation is completed, and grow this and see what happens with the E. coli. The E. coli was able to survive on what sample they collected for over 50 hours and generate electricity. That also generated more electricity than what the, uh, well, onodesis strain was able to do, as that simply can't use that material in the same way.
shifting from uh, promising news and uh, use of uh, various beers that are not worth consuming, we have disappointing news and uh, that the rate of cancer in the 50s has well increased by 80% over the last 30 years. Now, nearly doubling the rate of cancer over 30 years is actually not that terrible a result. By itself, that is an increase of about 2.5% every year. Now, a large proportion of that increase can be explained by a far more pragmatic and optimistic answer. That is, better detection. And better detection means better survival. And arguably, this is why rather than just an 80% increase in mortality or deaths over that same time frame, it's only been a 27.5% increase. That means about a third of those new cases will die, but that's a third of the increase, which is a substantial improvement. The second caveat to this is that that is an aggregate change. Now, aggregate changes aren't all that useful. They make for great headlines, like an 80% increase over 30 years, but it doesn't really tell you a lot about what's happening. For example, the research shows that one of the, if not the most significant, increase in cancer rates and mortality was amongst females with breast cancer, although males did make up a small proportion thereof. But nonetheless, there are things like this where, without breaking down the, well, actual, let's say, major players in terms of cancer, it doesn't mean a lot. Then there's also issues like, say, uh, nasopharynx and prostate cancers had major increases as well, but you had a decline in things like liver cancer. So this is where uh, understanding which cancers have increased and which has decreased, where and in which groups, is kind of important. The decrease in nasopharynx cancer could easily be attributed to things like reductions in well, tobacco use. And meanwhile, the increase in prostate cancer and similar is, well, partly explainable by the sheer increase in population. And by contrast, there were other cancers that are not so easy to explain. Some require, well, several steps. For instance, liver cancer is generally a result of inflammation or cirrhosis of the liver, which is generated by hepatitis, and specifically the hepatitis B virus. A lot because hepatitis is, well, inflammation of the liver. That's what the word means. But because we have a vaccine that deals with this very well, you don't really see that as much. Now, you're still going to see issues with the liver, largely due to diet, but these aren't as significant now that people are aware of issues around it, and hopefully, although hope is for the hopeless, are going to change their behaviours and are not well, consume exceptionally fatty diets that lead to liver issues. Although that is arguably a overly optimistic and a likely pointless hope. Even a critical assessment of this in other editorial reports on the publication itself point out that there's noteworthy variation across regions and that it's likely that there are specific risk factors for different populations in different areas. For example, some populations and cultures are going to have a almost vegan diet, and therefore they have a significantly lower risk of, of fatty liver owing to the issues around a high-fat diet. And meanwhile, they may have other issues to do with their diet that contribute to different cancers again, or lifestyle. There are all kinds of indicators and you can't just take a blanket approach to all of it. Finally, there is an issue to do with the actual data itself. This is basically a retroactive analysis of data that's been collected over the years. The problem with this is that all of the countries that have contributed data to the data set have varied drastically in their quality. This means that you can't rely on every country not only just being honest in their data set, but being accurate in their data set. They may not be able to, say, break down cancer into a specific subcategory as effectively as other countries. This could be due to well, lack of resources, a lack of policy that has them differentiated so, 
or simply that they're not able to do that testing. There's a lot of variability in the data, and so it's interesting, but it's more a, uh, here is a broad trend. Now go poke at it to see what falls out. The last clinical news we have for you this week is a more an interesting case study, uh, and it was a the Twitter post. The uh, presentation was Blue Blood. Yeah, the case study is interesting because uh, Blue Blood is incredibly rare in most living organisms, and the well, only example that comes to mind is the horseshoe crab. But obviously this is not from a horseshoe crab, but rather from a human. And the diagnosis was, well, relatively straightforward, mostly. It is something called methoglobinemia, or otherwise called methema globinemia. It's a result of elevated methoglobinin in the blood, and this is often a result of medication issues, or other times it can be due to food, certain chemicals you're exposed to, and in rare instances, an inherited disorder. It involves the, the blood in the human body, and specifically the iron or ferrous within it. Not being in the form of Fe2, but Fe3, this is due to oxidization, or the loss of an electron, and therefore the opening of another free space on the iron molecule, for theoretically oxygen to bind to, but no. Given the lack of oxygen, you also end up in a position where you now have what is effectively a blue blood. It's the same sort of phenomena you would observe if, well, you were looking at the difference between a vein and an artery. Arteries carry oxygenated blood, veins do not, which is why they appear blue. The treatment is at least relatively straightforward. It's use of methylene blue. Methylene blue is administered intravenously over a period of a few minutes, so it's not really a slow treatment, which you might expect. The result of this is that you often get improvement in an hour or two. The advantages to uh, giving the methylene blue and or what it does is that it is a reductive reaction with the iron or ferrous that is within the body, allowing it to uh, gain an electron and therefore go back to the Fe2 plus state rather than the Fe3 plus state. Now on to uh, broader genetic modification news, and uh, claims from China they found a way to genetically modify organisms without needing to use the uh, CRISPR mechanism. Now, uh, to be quite blunt with this, this is partly a response to international politics and partly just general attempts to find alternatives to CRISPR that aren't necessarily as uh, difficult, let's say. The political side of this is fairly straightforward. There are looming export restrictions likely to come from the United States of America, preventing China from accessing biotech, such as CRISPR. From a pure research point of view, well, there have been a number of developments that look at exactly this. Ways to modify DNA that, well, don't require CRISPR, or modifications thereof, as there are several precursors and associated mechanisms, some more useful than others. This new system is called Sident. Further to just wanting to find alternatives to CRISPR, the need is there for mechanisms that aren't CRISPR-based for targeting non-nucleus-based DNA, or at least non-DNA, something like RNA or messenger RNA, based in other parts of the plant or animal. For instance, the mitochondria, chloroplasts, and so on. All of these are much harder to get CRISPR into, and so alternatives were needed. And this is arguably where they claim their approach is superior. Largely because it's protein-based, and therefore somewhat easier to, uh, let's say, trick the transporters inside of the cell to move it through and into the mitochondria or chloroplast. The other advantage this expresses is that where CRISPR will modify both sides of the DNA at the same time, this is only going to modify one strand of DNA, and therefore when the cell goes along during the normal process of cell division, it's going to correct the other side of the strand, and therefore you don't need as, well, let's say, as much change in the cell at any one given time. 
you just allow the uh, changes to occur initially at a much smaller level and then get amplified through uh, successive generations where that change is copied, reinforced and transferred to the other side of the DNA strand. On the basis of genetically modifying crops, we have a article from the Breakthrough Institute which is well, both good and bad. It's good that they recognize the uh, needs and benefits of genetically modified crops, but they also propose new biosafety laws that are needed because of this. Uh, no, genetically modified crops are just as safe as any regular crop is going to be. The only arguable issue that may occur, and this is a very uh, nebulous concern, is that if you have genetically modified crops and they are near to, uh, let's say, heirloom or uh, culturally significant crops that you want to hold on to, you may get crossbreeding. That is a minor concern relative to the food security that they bring. This is also why, arguably, since 1996, South Africa has been one of the uh, well, major sources of food security over there. Despite all the issues that have occurred, they remain one of the larger producers of food. They've embraced, and have at least since 1996, implemented genetically modified corn. Other countries by comparison, such as Uganda, Tanzania, Ghana, Cameroon, and Mozambique, have had field trials going for, well, in some instances up to 15 years without approving a single GMO. While those countries have been running field trials for an incredibly long time and unnecessarily so, at least six other countries have approved GMOs and have been producing them. This is uh, no small challenge given that, well, Africa is one of those places that's expected to have ever-growing issues with climate change, such as increased drought length, increased number of pests that are going to consume food, such as locusts, and, well, just in short, the need for food security given the growing population in Africa. The other interesting aspect to this article is the uh, analysis of how media has covered, well, the news in general about genetic modified organisms, and GM crops in particular, Although the exact analysis conducted is, to be quite blunt, kind of, the authors found 1,004 articles and then chose 14 of these articles to analyze. Yeah. Nonetheless, they explain their four methods, which is a uh, breath of fresh air, given that very rarely would you have anything but a statement of, uh, this is what we found when doing this, so the article gets full marks for having explained what they've done, even if, well, what they did was not necessarily the best possible application of their method. Next we have environmental news, and specifically news about environmental activists. That is, approximately one activist gets killed every two days over the last ten years. Given that many of these Activists are involved in groups like, say, Greenpeace that will go out of their way to go and destroy these field trial sites that allow for the development of food for places like Africa, the Philippines, and other developing countries that, to be quite clear about it, desperately need food security. Well, their actions lead to more deaths than what they themselves experience, so it's something along the lines of what goes around comes around. And in this case, a significant portion of these deaths are not just attributed to idiots going out and destroying field trials, rather a surprising portion of it was indigenous communities who, well, unfortunately were killed by things like mining and logging businesses. It's noteworthy that almost none of the recorded deaths were from environmental idiots gluing themselves to roads, which, yeah... Next we have a uh, development in the field of mathematics and a, a puzzle that's stumped them for quite a long time. In fact, it's about 50 years. It's the Mobius Strip. But how small can you make said Mobius Strip without it intersecting with itself? Yeah, 
The Mobius strip is a awkward shape. It's essentially a single straight loop that's been twisted. Therefore, the inside becomes the outside on one side, and the outside becomes the inside on the other. Well, the problem is based on a 1977 proposal, and that is, if you had a Mobius strip, how small could you make it? And that is based on the ratio between the length and width of the paper involved. That being, if you had a 1cm wide strip of paper, the shortest length that paper could be to still make a Mobius strip would be 1.73 centimeters, or the square root of 3. This leads to how that was being tested, and the uh, approach was surprisingly simple. The mathematician made paper strips, folded them appropriately, and then squished them flat to create a 2D model. These were then cut open. What was found was that unlike the uh, predicted rectangular form of these models, they ended up turning out looking more like a trapezoid, and this seemed to be the answer. That is, the exact answer required was exactly the square root of 3, or 1.73. Going from what seems like a boring topic in mathematics, although certainly not for any mathematician, we instead have the uh, planned obsolescence and death of robots. Yeah. It's a development in robotics intended to make it so that, well, robots will die, which does sound rather morbid, and does defeat the whole point of a robot theoretically being able to live forever. The design is surprisingly simple and elegant in some ways. The uh, structure that is the robot has an internal ultraviolet LED embedded within it. This is what initiates the whole decomposition process, and it takes about an hour to happen. When the uh, LED is turned on, it releases 365 nanometer wavelength light, or ultraviolet light, for 30 minutes. When this happens, it initiates a reaction that creates a 120 degrees Celsius well, reaction, which lasts for about 60 minutes, and when that occurs, it then uh, fundamentally destroys the structure of the robot. Uh, this then leads to a secondary reaction, which is also 120 degrees, which lasts for 90 minutes, and that further decomposes the entirety of it, uh, down into uh, something uh, more similar to goop than anything else, and certainly nothing similar to the original robot. The uh, challenge with this is that said robot must be made from a particular kind of chemical, that chemical is called diphenyl iodonium hexafluorophosphate in a silicone resin. The whole development is uh, premised on the idea of being able to initiate this reaction and take advantage of the chemistry of the particular robot's makings that allow them to uh, decompose it after it's done its job, which could be useful in all kinds of ways depending on, uh, to an extent, where and what they're being used for. For instance, if they respond to an external stimulus, such as light being able to get through the skin, these could be used as an incredibly efficient means of delivering drugs. By contrast, if it's not an external stimulus, they may only be useful for well, applications in environmental or industrial settings. Despite that, they are at least a useful and interesting development. Next we have the... Uh, well, the reality of Harvard, and that Harvard University is apparently America's worst school for free speech, which most universities aren't exactly welcoming of free speech anyway, so this should be no surprise. The report itself is from the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, otherwise called FIRE, and they are a, a somewhat partisan organization, so what they find is going to be... Uh, let's say, uh, not necessarily the uh, most independent of results. The worrying thing, however, is that even when you sort of look at this as a, uh, let's say, biased study, Harvard still scored 0 out of 100. That's 0. To be clear about it, it's not that they scored 0. It's that they can't actually be given an overall score lower than zero, but their actual score was in the negative digits. 
And this is down to the uh, rather punitive measures they've taken against various academics over the year and the effect this has on their score. The top five universities, by comparison, have scored somewhere around 78 out of 100 or a little bit lower. This includes Michigan Technical University, Auburn University, University of New Hampshire, Oregon State University, and Florida State University. Beyond the uh, university's uh, rather terrible results, there was a, another factor to this which is somewhat more alarming, and it's twofold. The first is that about 56% of students are concerned that they're going to face repercussions for their speech, as it's worded, getting cancelled. 27% of students believe violence is acceptable to suppress campus speech. No. <laughs> Just no. <laughs> this is not a uh, trial by combat error, where if you think you're right, you can just beat someone down and claim that you are correct. We live in what is arguably at least a semi-civilized period of time where, especially in a university, if you disagree with somebody, you talk it out, not fight them. This, of course, does lead us to uh, Lauren Bobbitt, the Republican lawmaker who demonstrates why sometimes talking it out doesn't really work and you do need to exhibit at least a minor degree of violence in the form of ejecting her from a showing of Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice is arguably not the musical we would have expected her to be ejected from, but it is what it is. Both sides of the matter in this instance have uh, claimed very different accounts of what's happened, and uh, frankly, neither of these are particularly important, and just to note that they have both uh, argued very different events happened. For the purposes of this video, we're simply going to make the point that the uh, issue was an attempt to resolve this supposedly peaceably by directly pointing out this is what should not be done and this is the issue and you're interfering with others' enjoyment of the musical, followed by the use of some limited force in ejecting them from the venue. Shifting to astronomical news and disappointing news at that, Brand 3, or the Indian lunar rover, has gone to sleep and it may not be waking up again, which is kind of like saying that you sent Old Yeller off to the farm. The reason for this is surprisingly simple. By comparison to a lot of NASA's rovers that have rather expensive, uh, well, generators on board, Chinjaran 3 uh, relies almost entirely on the solar power, and because the lunar night is setting in, it is unlikely to get power again for quite a significant amount of time. The issue with it not having any power is that it's not actually built to cope with the lunar night, which can get down to negative 120 degrees Celsius or 184 freedom units. And that's a concern, as if the electronics get so cold that they break somehow, or other elements of the rover, it may wake up, but it may not be able to move, it may not be able to conduct all the uh, tests it's built to be able to perform, and so on. And this is why it's a concern. But there is some optimistic hope that it might wake up once it gets light again. Hopefully around the 22nd of September we'll have an idea as to whether or not the Indian rover is going to wake up and, well, work once more. And next we have other lunar news and it's the uh, somewhat dystopian and disconcerting plan to create a hyper-telescope on the moon. The temptation to make a joke about that's not a moon is quite powerful as a result. The advantages of a, uh, well, space-based telescope are uh, massive, and the simple reality is that they bring many benefits that aren't possible for terrestrial telescopes. And this is because the terrestrial telescopes rely heavily on being massive, and why they're built often not in mountains, so that they're as close to the space level as possible. This to a degree, minimizes atmospheric effect on the signal received. Building it in space means that not only do you have a, a giant telescope, 
but a giant telescope that gets no distortion from the atmosphere, and that would be a massive improvement. The exact plan proposed in the article involves something similar to the Arecibo telescope. This was the telescope that recently imploded on itself. The dish, so to say, would be made up of a large number of mirrors, and these mirrors would work together to focus the image onto a receptor hung above it, and this suspended receptor would then be able to transmit the images back to Earth. An idealistic solution, but one that, well, if anything like the Arecibo disaster was to happen, would basically destroy this. Next we have a further astronomical news, but it's the discovery of, well, particular chemicals in an exoplanet, and this is kind of important. The James Webb Space Telescope has identified that K2-18b in an exoplanet about 8.5 to 9 times the size of Earth has not only carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, but methane and other carbon-bearing molecules. This is useful as, well, these are some of the essential building blocks to life if the well, atmosphere has hydrogen and water, which it appears to have. This is useful as, arguably, it is within the habitable zone, so that means it's within the range in the well, solar system where, theoretically, a life could exist. Sadly, not life within our solar system, but instead 120 light years away in the constellation of Leo. So, it's not like we're going to be seeing this anytime soon. That also means no cat girl aliens. What makes the astronomers so, uh, let's say, optimistic that life could be found here is the detection of dimethyl sulfide and at least on Earth, this is only produced by living organisms, but, well, yeah, the issue is that they're inferring its existence, and inference is not necessarily a reliable means of identifying the existence. Now, theoretically, the James Webb Space Telescope could confirm if it is present, but, yeah, we don't have that yet, so expecting aliens is maybe a bridge too far. The final news we have for you is, well, in preparation for not just Thanksgiving Day, but Christmas and various other annual gift-giving festivities that will occur in the near future. That is, the arguable science behind gift-giving. Social psychologists, as terrible as their research is most of the time, have conducted a surprising, well, body of literature and research on gift-giving for some bizarre reason. A lot of it has been for the self-help industry, but others have been, well, actual research that is intended to be useful, even if arguably it's not. This leads to the uh, general findings of most research, that is, that expectations that a gift should be a surprise, provoke a big reaction, be unique and expensive, all turn out to be largely incorrect. That is, uh, people don't really expect it to be a surprise, they don't expect a big reaction, they don't expect it to be unique, and they don't really expect it to be expensive in all cases. This leads to the uh, surprising amount of, well, results that are observed. Other than it not being a surprise, which is generally bad because people don't know what they're going to get and often don't get what they actually want, you also have the fact that there is a social expectation of a minimum expense on gifts, and as a result, if you don't spend the minimum, you generally get, let's say, a, or let's say you fail to meet the social contract. Spending just the right amount means that you don't lose anything in that respect, but spending more than that also leads to net loss, as you don't gain anything more from spending more on said gift. The blog post goes into a range of other factors to consider, and these include things like the utility of the gift over the long term, the nature of the gift, and how thoughtful a gift is. And it gives a greater explanation of not just what we've mentioned, but these other variables as well. 
that's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions you have below.